Well, hello, and thanks for joining me for another episode of the Friday Reporter Podcast. Today's guest is, uh, well, we've uh, known, been knowing each other for, for so many years, and this is the typical Washington relationship, right? We met for real in real life uh, at the kindergarten uh, orientation, uh, no less than at least uh, a long time ago. So Jim Tankersley from the New York Times. Uh, hello, hello, my friend. How are you? I'm great. I'm so excited to, to finally be here. I feel like uh, it's, it's taken forever to make our schedules match up mostly mine. And so it's, it's awesome to finally do it. Well, I can't imagine what's been keeping you busy. I mean, life is so full and there's yeah. travel and there's, uh, you know, covering the White House on a regular basis. So that'll keep you busy. Yeah, it's a slow job. It's There's not much, not much news <laughs> no. on that lately. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So, uh, so let's get into it. So tell me, Jim, how in the world did you, did you wake up one morning and decide you wanted to be a journalist? How in the world did you get started in this business? Um, it's a great question. There's basically two answers. The first, uh, and so this goes back a long way. Um, when I was in eighth grade, I guess, um, uh, I signed up for, we had like school clubs at my middle school and mm -hmm. I signed up for the school newspaper. And, uh, and somehow I, I, I managed to like, my first assignment was writing like an editorial and I had to like find something that you feel strongly about. And at the time, um, as you could tell, I'm, I'm wearing a baseball hat right now. I felt strongly about my right to wear a baseball hat to school, okay. uh, which we weren't allowed to do. This is like the, the early 90s, yeah. the early yeah. 90s in, in rural <laughs> Oregon, there was a real fear that anyone wearing a baseball cap was in a gang. And so they had this dress code that banned baseball hats. And so I wrote this editorial basically because, and they, but what they said was that they're not a necessary piece of clothing. I see. And, I, and if I remember correctly, how I phrased it in the, in the, in the editorial was something like, well, okay, if hats aren't necessary, well, like the school is carpeted. So like shoes and socks aren't necessary <laughs> and it's, it's climate controlled. So really like for necessity, all I need to come to school in is my underwear. <laughs> And, uh, and we published the editorial on uh -huh. like a, like a, it was like, you know, like not even a real newspaper, just like printed sheets of paper. Right. And I got called into the principal's office for the first time in my life. Oh my gosh. And, and I thought, this is really cool. <laughs> um, I, 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 you know, I was a kid who hated conflict, hated, like didn't ever want to be in trouble. I like, right. can still remember the two times I got my name on the board in elementary school, mm -hmm. but I really liked being called into the principal's office because it obviously had gotten a rise out of the administration. The challenging so that's leadership, right? I mean, that's really right. what it is at that point. Yeah. So it put a bug in my ear. And then in uh, in high school, um, I needed a summer job after my freshman year. I had taken journalism a as a class in, in school and started working on the school paper a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I should say my, my grandfather, my mom's dad, had been actually a Washington Post reporter uh, until... I didn't know that. Yeah, until he uh, he decided um, uh, well, basically that um, he wanted to start a family and didn't think that being a newspaper man was conducive to having a family. Uh, <laughs> and so he uh, he We've retired. proven that true over and yeah. over again in our life. <laughs> so so he retired and and um, and started just started selling advertisements for the rest of his career. Um, but uh, but I knew he had been a journalist. So anyway, so that 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 had influenced me. And the long story short is I I needed a job for the summer. Um, it was a small enough town that the publisher of the local newspaper sat behind us in church. And I like walked into his office mm. one day and asked if I could please have an internship. And he put me to work like writing up weddings and obituaries and, uh, you gotta and, start somewhere, and right? went from there. Yeah. <laughs> That's fantastic. And so, so you go, went to college, graduated, got out into the space, but you really sort of worked your way back into the, or worked your way here to Washington, right? I mean, through yeah. lots of other newsrooms. I had one of those careers that that very rarely exists anymore of sort of like climbing the rungs of, of regional newspapers. So I started at the the Oregonian in Portland, which was the, the paper I sort of grew up learning to read with um, and then went um, went to the Rocky Mountain News in Denver, moved to Ohio for the politics, basically to, to cover politics at the Toledo Blade and from Toledo got hired into D.C. Uh, at first as a like a political reporter for the Chicago Tribune's Washington Bureau and, mm -hmm. and then have been living in, in uh, the D.C. area uh, ever since, uh, 16 years, basically. So, right, and writing tremendous, you know, cover stories for the National Journal that might household still talks about and I mean a variety of other very cool things but now today um you tell me correct me if I'm wrong Washington correspondent for the New York Times or excuse me White House correspondent for the New York Times is that right 
Yeah. Yeah. I got hired to the times to cover taxes and economics, which has been sort of my specialty for more than a decade now. Um, and when Biden was elected, uh, the top editors at the Times made this decision, which which I think was really smart in in, in retrospect, that, that that we needed more policy experts on the White House team because this would be a very different White House to cover than the, the Trump Absolutely. White House had been. Yeah. So um so one day um uh, in like early twenty one the the bureau chief just called me and said. Uh, uh, hey, guess what? You're a White House correspondent, basically. Wow. <laughs> um, and uh, and so I, you know, I hadn't ever contemplated it before that moment. I hadn't asked for it, but um, it's been a lot of fun. And uh, uh, so I basically kept my econ writer job. And then also now I'm sort of covering, I mostly cover economic policy in the White House and and things related to it. But everybody who covers the White House covers a little bit of everything. So you just have to. You, right. you know, we, we take turns on who's sort of following the president every day. We take turns on foreign trips. So um, I covered the the everything from, you know, uh, the bodies coming home from Afghanistan to Dover uh, uh, last year to like the Tampa Bay Buccaneers Super Bowl celebration at the White House. So there's there's a lot of differences in this piece. That's super neat. Well, everything and everything that the White House does sort of brushes up on the economy in some way or another, especially the last two years, we've really, there's been a lot of economic news and a lot of sort of what, what kind of impact does that have on, on midterms for the president and, you know, really just about everything is going to be affected. So that, that makes a ton of sense that you would be there. Talk to me a little bit about, um, about that specific beat. So you, you travel with the president when you, when he travels, is that right? I do. I mean, um, not always. We're, we're, there's a pool rotation of, right. of um, you know, reporters uh, and the times goes sometimes I think we're um, we're going to go a lot more now uh, just by ourselves if we're not in the pool. Mm -hmm. um, but I've been, um, you know, several places in the country with Biden. I went to Detroit to watch him drive an electric Hummer. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, have been on a couple of foreign trips to um, the G20 summit in Rome last year, the climate conference in Scotland, uh, and then most recently to the uh, G7 summit in Germany, um, which turned out to actually be all about oil, uh, which was really interesting. So um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a wide variety of places you get to go. So not only a journalist though, but also an author. Uh, and you and I had a chance to visit at, you know, during that process, as you were working through that process, will you tell me a little bit about how, how that worked for you? Every single uh, friend of ours that I've had on the show that's talked to me about how they wrote uh, had a little bit of a different experience. When you, when you wrote your book, were you on leave? Tell me a little bit about how that process worked for you. Yeah, the correct way to write a book is to take a nice uh, a leave that allows you the time <laughs> to do the reporting and the writing. Um, that is not what I did. <laughs> I, um, uh, Some are lucky enough to have right. that arrangement. Uh, you are, are not the only one that I've spoken to that's done a little bit of everything. So what the the book, um, which is called The Riches of This Land, is, is sort of an um, an argument about why America built a great middle class and how we could rebuild it again. And it's based on um, a lot of reporting I've done over a decade. And so, ask uh, I, so I, the, the first and most important thing is, is that I saved all of my notebooks and recordings of interviews going back like to National Journal, which I started at in 2010. Yeah. Um, and so I had, and then I revisited a bunch of the people I had talked to. I I went back and spent more time with them. I um, spent more time with their stories and added new things, um, stuff for, that I had done for the times. So I built it all out. And um, and to be honest, I, I just spent basically the better part of a year getting up at 5 a.m. every day. And some mornings I wrote 20 words and just sort of sat looking at a screen, yelling at myself for not being able to write when I'm burning all this sleep time. Yes. And other mornings, it like just, you know, flowed and I wrote like a thousand words. And um, then I took a few weeks of vacation uh, at the end to kind of hammer out the last couple of chapters. And um, it was really hard, uh, but, but rewarding. And, um, and then it, it, you know, the book, I finished the book in the fall of 2019 and started making all these great plans for a book tour and all the ways we were going to promote it and everything. And then the pandemic hit uh, before it came out. And so the book was released right in the dead of the summer of 2020. And um, it was a real different experience than I had imagined it was going to be. Yeah. I, well, you did a lot of TV around it and you did, did. quite a bit of virtual touring, if you will, for the book. Um, 
any thoughts on doing another one at some point? Yeah, I'd love to do another do book again? at some point. I, 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 I'm way too busy now uh, to, to do one. Um, this beat is is you have to take a leave if you're going to write a book off the White House beat. And, and right now there's just too much, um, uh, too much news for me to, to take a book leave. Um, but uh, yeah, sure. I would, I would, I would love to do another one. There's, there's do it a again. lot. Uh, there's a lot. Yeah. There's a lot of things I'm really interested in writing about. I, I think I would probably not. Um, I, I would love to branch out a little bit more and, and write uh, about, you know, different facets of the, of the economy or of politics or, or, or just something totally different. But uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that it, um, it, if you'd asked me in the immediate aftermath of writing it, I would have said, no, this, I'm, I never do it again. But it's, <laughs> it's kind of like running a long race. When you're done with yeah. it, you're like, okay, I feel great that I did that. I'm not doing that again. And then over time, you're like, oh, I bet I could, I bet I could run this faster next time. I bet like, I could. Yeah. This is the trick that they, that, that gets you to have a second kid too. Right. Right. <laughs> you yeah. Forget, exactly. <laughs> you forget that you haven't slept. You forget that you haven't right. eaten. You forget all of those other things and you decide maybe we'll just go do this again. Right. Exactly. Um, I'm, I'm always curious because I think I had talked to Jonathan Martin right before his book was getting ready to come out. I had talked to uh, David Drucker, similar experiences from those guys too, that they, a lot of what their book, um, sort of centered around was previous re recording or excuse me, previous reporting and other um, experiences that they had had over time. And I think that that probably does help you in the creative process because you know what you're going to um, do when you ultimately produce that final product. I think so. I mean, I think for me, it was really helpful to not have to go and start at the beginning and say, I don't know what this book's going to say, but I'm, I'm, I'll figure it out as I report. I, I sort of had built, felt like um, what the book was, was a chance to finally put all the pieces together of stories that I'd been writing for years and years and years and try to make them add up to something that felt bigger than just a front page story. Sure. Um, and so that's, that is in, in many ways really helpful. I think um, the downside is I, I would have loved to just go spend a year or two years with, you know, some of the characters in my book and get yeah. much deeper, richer scenes with them, understand um, and, you know, when you're just relying a lot on past reporting, that's not a luxury you have. Right, right. So, uh, so now here you are, you're reflecting on the fact that you've written a book, you're covering the White House. But as you look back over your career, Jim, is there a particular story or set of stories? Is there, is there something that sticks out to you as something you're especially proud of that you've covered in the past? Yeah, I, I think about this a lot. I mean, the, 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 Easiest and best answer is um, the main character in the book, essentially, is a guy named Ed Green, who uh, who I met in North Carolina uh, years ago when I was working for the Washington Post. And um, he remains the most extraordinary person I've ever profiled. That's why he's such a big character in the book. He's just this soft-spoken, incredibly thoughtful, hardworking guy who... Um, you know, used to have a job that paid a middle class wage, and then uh, had to quit that job to move to North Carolina to take care of his his dying mother, mm -hmm. and moved there just as a whole bunch of the middle class jobs in that economy were going away. Mm -hmm. And rather than complain about it, or um, a lot of other things, you know, vent political anger about it, Ed just worked more. He, he took a whole, this whole series of second jobs and um, he's an extraordinary guy. And I think a lot about, uh, about his story. I, I still text with him sometimes. He, he te likes to text on holidays just to ask how I'm doing. And I, and oh, I like man. To, so it's that, that's great. And that's the story that sticks with me most. I think now in the, in the stuff that I'm doing now for the times, probably the stories that I feel most proud of are the ones where um, we can fuse sort of um, interesting things that we notice in data, you know, like economic trends that maybe nobody else is picking up with some stories of, of how people are actually experiencing them. And um, it's, it's a different, like, you know, everybody loves scoops, uh, knowing things that other people don't know first. My favorite kind of scoop is the sort of scoop where it's like, it's, it's not something you got someone to tell you that was a secret. It's just an open secret that's been hiding in numbers. And Same when you, and when mm -hmm. you can find that in the numbers and say, Hey, here's a, this is actually really important, but no one's noticed yet. I, I, I like, I like doing those stories a lot. Your signature reporting for me, the, 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 the model and the, and sort of just your approach in general is always to be a storyteller. And that's something that I've always admired about your work. 
because you do exactly that. You, you look for the data and then you look for the person, the, the business, the, the, whatever it is, the specific example that sort of illustrates that so well for the reader. Um, is that, is that still part of your thought process as you go into it, looking for ways to identify and make it real for your readers? Or is, is that changed over time? No, it, it totally is. And it's really, it's my biggest, both my biggest aspiration and biggest frustration in, in, in the job. Because by necessity, the main character in a huge portion of my stories is the president of the United States. Of course. And um, the people around him and how they make decisions and uh, that's that just needs to be the case. Uh, and there's been so much news on economic policy that it's difficult to to get more time. Uh, but on the occasion that you have uh, to get out to talk to people, um, I did a, a story uh, right before I, I came on the uh, the White House beat. I guess it was um, back when when uh, under the Trump administration, where I, I drove to Delaware and talked to a guy who, who runs a lighting store mm-hmm. about the impact of tariffs on his small business because the Trump administration had done all these tariffs on lights and he was the one feeling the pain, not like not Best Buy or Target or the big box places. They had ways to shield themselves from the pain, but he, he really was. And I, I love those types of stories. I wish I could do more of them on the beat right now, yeah. but it's, but it's hard when you, when every day there's um, real demand for explain why the president is doing this, explain how this, this is happening. Okay. Um, so we'll back to it, uh, I'm though, hopeful. Yeah, sure. no, I'm, and, and I'm, and I'm sure actually, I mean, I, we're, I have a, a, a whole list of them that we're going to try to get through this fall. So that's, awesome. that's the, the next phase, I hope. What do you see? Are there trends that you're following? Are there things that you're looking at as we head into midterms, regardless of that's the prism that we all look at life through here in Washington, DC is what are the impacts? What's, is there anything that's sort of sticking out for you or anything that's grabbing your interest more than others at this point? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm always curious about how economic issues uh, influence voters, particularly in the midterms. You know, in the, the political science research is actually pretty clear that they, it's it's often not a big factor. You know, the Trump guys thought for sure they were going to do way better than expected in the midterms because mm-hmm. uh, the economy was doing well, and and it, it didn't it didn't happen. Republicans thought their tax cut bill was going to win a lot of votes. It it didn't happen actually. Yeah. Um, um, so I'm interested in it in this time though because the big economic issue uh, for most voters, particularly independent voters and Republicans, is inflation, which is a very personal issue. It's not an abstract mm-hmm. um, issue. And everybody feels the, the pain of higher prices. So I, I'm really interested in how, how that's um, playing out. And uh, on the flip side, I'm interested in this in- incredible dichotomy in the polling between the voters who care a lot about the economy as a motivating issue to vote and then the voters who don't care at all about the economy as a motivating issue to vote, mm-hmm. uh, which is, you know, very sort of roughly split. The Democratic coalition um, is motivated by abortion and, and climate change and a bunch of other issues ahead of economic policy. Yeah. Um, and then the the Republican coalition is really motivated by right now by economic issues, particularly inflation. And independents are more like the Republicans, but they don't they don't trust Republicans as much as the Republicans do on. So it's, it's um, interesting. Anyway, it's, it's, a, it's going to be a very interesting question to me, how much the president talks about economic issues uh, as he tries to, to avoid, you know, losing the house and the Senate in, in the midterms um, because there's reasons in the polling, why he might need to shore that up, that vulnerability up. And there's reasons why he, he might just want to talk about other stuff. Yeah. And, and that's the one thing that I have been consuming over the course of the last couple of weeks is that, for the first time, at least in, in recent history, both parties are completely galvanized behind the issues that they care about, and they are completely yeah. different set of issues. Totally. And so how does that translate into midterms? Well, certainly it's going to be a game of turnout, right? I mean, that's ultimately what people are sort of saying is that, you know, if Democrats can turn people out and if those issues are motivating enough to get them to vote, then maybe perhaps midterms will go differently than history says that that it will go. But I guess we get to wait and see. <laughs> yeah. And it's also, but I mean, think about it. I actually don't, I, I, I believe the polling, but it's also, I, you, you look at the polling people, everybody's concerned about some facet of the economy. We, we are not living in a time where very many Americans think the economy is doing awesome. Um, and that's 
you know, there's lots of reasons for that. The hangover from the pandemic, the way that things have come out, inflation obviously being the big one, even with very low unemployment, you, um, uh, other than in my Twitter mentions, you just don't see a lot of people claiming that like, this is the greatest economy of our lifetimes. Mm -hmm. But but I think what we found in the 2018 midterms and in some past midterms too, is that um, people can can feel one way about the economy, but vote based on something else. Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, I, I, I will be really interested to see, you know, what what is actually driving people to turn out to vote, just like you just said. Yeah, yeah. All right. So uh, tell me, because you are a well-read guy and you uh, are busy in life, what is it that you, is there a must read for you in the day, like in the morning? I mean, you are, obviously have to prepare quite a bit before your day even gets started, but is there something that Jim Tankersley wakes up and says, I have got to, that's the if, if there's nothing else you have to read, is there someone, something, some publication other than, of course, the New York Times cover to cover? Um, right. Is there anything else that, that you read in the morning that gets you smart about the economy and or the White House or otherwise every day? I mean, I do read, uh, just to plug my own paper for a second, I do read the morning, every morning, uh, 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 David Leonhardt's email, which it helps that, that it's written by a, you know, a former uh, New York Times economics reporter. So he, he writes a lot about issues that I care about. And also it, it very much dr drives, you know, how a lot of the people in my world see things. So I, I do read that. I, I actually don't read very many political newsletters on a regular basis. I used to read them constantly. Yeah. Um, but now, um, now I, I find it's better for my time to look through the Wall Street Journal has a couple of um, like a markets uh, a sort of new newsletter, like basically what's going on in the economy today newsletter and a top news newsletter that I, I read both of. And then I, I try to click through the links. Um, uh, and um, and the, the post puts out a, a top politics uh, sort of email every morning that I click through the links uh, off of that. And then um, I try to read as much as I can from the FT as well, because that is, you know, um, I, I want to be deeply grounded in the issues that are sort of the thing that put me on the White House team. Right. Um, and so um, I want to make sure that I'm on top of what what people are writing about on those, even things that I don't write very much about. Like I don't write very much about financial markets anymore, mm -hmm. but I, it's important to know, like reading, I read deal book uh, in, in the mornings. Um, but, but I would tell you the most indispensable uh, newsletter of my day has n almost nothing to do with my job, but it's just absolutely fun to read is Matt Levine's newsletter for um, Bloomberg, which is basically like a finance. He's a former trader who, um, who just writes essentially the funniest thing you will ever read on bond markets, on mergers, on, he just has a long running, his coverage of the Elon Musk Twitter saga is, um, is just laugh out loud and also uh -huh. incredibly yeah. insightful. So yeah, yeah. so this, the, these are the things that I read. That's awesome. Uh, so as we get to the end of our conversation, uh, my question is always, uh, who who should I talk to next? Who should be on the pod next? So, do you have a recommendation for me? I mean, I have uh, I have a bunch of people who I would love to hear on the pod, but I actually think you know for your uh, audience and, and and for knowing some of the people you've talked to in the past, I, I think the the people who I think are sort of the unsung heroes of Washington and who have incredibly interesting and incredibly punishing jobs are congressional reporters mm -hmm. um, uh, because they like white house reporters have to be versed on everything policy wise, but they also have to know just insane amounts of like geography and what, who cares about what, and also like be able to recognize people on site uh, you know, random senators coming off elevators and everything. So I would recommend that you talk to my colleague, Emily Cochran, uh, who is my favorite uh, congressional uh, reporter who I work with on a, on a constant basis. Um, we have an amazing team. Um, um, Katie uh, Emmonson, Luke Broadwater, like we have uh, Annie Carney, like we've got uh, Carl Hulse, obviously, like a spectacular all-star team on the Hill. But Emily is the one who sort of works in my issue area the most. Awesome. And um, so I would definitely have her on. Okay. I'm going to tell her that you nominated her. That's awesome. Yeah. They do have a, uh, without question, and having worked on Capitol Hill with some of those folks, they do have an incredible recall for faces and names and what the district is and what the impact is and the history of how they've served and what they've done over the course of time. So I'll look out for Emily and I'll reach out to her. Jim, yeah. parting words, any thoughts? I mean, this has been really fun. I, I um, and I think that uh, it's a fun time in journalism right now, despite all the sort of insanities going on in our world, um, because it's 
you know, for better or for worse, there's a lot of policy happening um, in, in, in Washington right now. And that, that makes it a, a great time to have this job. I totally agree. I'm so glad to have you. I'm so glad this worked out. Thank you. And I Thank will you. talk to you again soon. Okay. Thanks, Lisa.